Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, we like to start by saying thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos, and we really do hope you'll learn something from this. Now buckle up and let's get right on it. Father Joseph Iannuzzi is a skilled violinist, former medical student and wrestler who once trained for the Olympic team. And also while in Rome, he assisted the former chief exorcist for the Diocese of Rome, the late Father Gabriel Morth. As for this video, I'd like to share something interesting that he once said during a lecture you'll probably find interesting, the devil's special hatred of women. According to Father Iannuzzi, there's a reason why more women experience demonic possession than men. And in his own words, the devil is like a madman. He can't get to marry. She's confirmed in grace. She defeated him, so he looks for other women. I am quite familiar with Satan's hatred toward Mary and therefore toward women in general on account of Mary. Father Yanuzi said, Satan is humiliated by the blessed virgin because God chose her, a pure and humble woman, to defeat him. According to Father Gabrielle Morth, women are more easily exposed to the danger of the devil, which is why statistics show more women are possessed by evil spirits than men. The devil particularly likes to prey upon attractive women and has personally encountered numerous cases of possessed women who were forced to prostitute themselves. The hand of Satan can also be found in the so-called women's rights issues, such as abortion and access to contraception. Since it is the devil's plan to mock God, he also employs the woman in the destruction, the breakdown of the family nucleus. Under the guise of rights, women use contraception and avail themselves of abortion, destroying their fertility and their offspring, which does great harm to themselves, their marriages, and their families. However, women do not have some kind of intrinsic flaw that makes them so susceptible to demonic possession. It is more like a diabolical loathing by substitution that makes them the special prey of the devil. Citing Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God announces that he will put enmity between you and the woman. Father Yanuzi further explained that Satan is unable to resist being envious of Mary's efficacious power that exceeds that of all other creatures. The blessed Virgin Mary is powerful because she is totally abandoned to the will of God. For the following part of this video, we'd also like to highlight some important points that Father Yanuzi shared regarding the devil. Number one, if someone is influenced by evil, they are still allowed to receive Holy Communion, which is always helpful and encouraged. Satan can't compete with the very presence of the body and blood of Jesus. An exorcism cannot hurt anyone. It has the power to free evil. Number two. Once the exorcism is complete, the evil spirits will be cast out, but there is nothing to ensure they will never return unless the person devotes themselves to good works and prayer. We can close the door to evil, but it's important that the person cooperate. They are not always able during their exorcism but the possessed individuals do get to the point where they are able to pray with the exorcists. Number three, there are many types of lifestyles that can make a person prone to becoming possessed, such as dabbling in witchcraft, black magic, curses, or invoking the dead. A very dangerous process, even forbidden in the Mosaic law, and all these things could put the person in contact with evil. Number four, demonic possession is not only recognized by Catholicism, but in every creed. Satan sees in us the image and likeness of God and wants to destroy it. He does not like humanity. If he sees that he can destroy other souls for one, he will because his objective is to end lives altogether. Number five, not all victims are responsible for their afflictions. With regard to being responsible, those who deliberately expose themselves to witchcraft, for example, expose themselves to Satan, along with people who persist in serious sin. The cases of people who are not responsible are those like the lives of the saints, those who sacrificed their lives and offered up their sufferings and torments for other souls. For the second half of this video, it's not related to the subject of exorcism, but there were quite a few of you who commented, and just so happened that Father Yanuzi wrote a whole book about it. There's a link to his book on Amazon for anyone who's interested, but as for this video, I'd like to share with you what his reply was when he was asked, in recent years, radical traditionalists have been attacking the church using a line allegedly uttered by Our Lady of La Salette. First, a little background. The apparition of Our Lady of La Salette occurred in 1846. The visionaries were two children in France named Maximin Gerard and Melanie Calvet. The local bishop approved the apparition in 1851, 
and that same year the two children were persuaded to write down information the Virgin Mary had given them. The question of what these secrets contained was on many people's minds, and the children were relentlessly pestered to reveal the information. It was not until 1851, when they were asked to write down the secrets so that they could be given to the Pope, that they complied. Afterwards, Maximin never revealed his secret. He is reported to have claimed that Mary told him that he would become a millionaire and that the next Pope would be French. None of those things happened, and scholars generally conclude that they were stories Maximin made up in an attempt to stop people from pestering him about the secret. When texts alleging to be Maximin's secret began to appear in the press, some of which are demonstrably false, the frustrated seer refused to either confirm or deny that they were his, saying it was the Pope's responsibility to decide whether the secret should be revealed. Melanie's story is different. Over the years, she apparently did begin revealing pieces of her secret to others, and in 1879 she published the whole thing. The trouble is, what she wrote in 1851 consisted of only three handwritten pages. The booklet she produced in 1879 was much longer than this, and undoubtedly contains ideas that were not part of the secret sent to the Pope. So, while Melanie's 1879 publication may have been based on her original secret, it undoubtedly contains elements not in the original, and we cannot tell which elements are which. That raises a concern about the Rome will lose the faith line. It may not have been in the secret sent to the Pope. Now let's hear what Father Yanusi's reply when he was asked. Before that, if you'd like to listen to the full interview, there's a link to the video in the description box as well. So feel free to check it out later. Not the Pope. No. Nowhere in hagiac, hagiographic or patristic or scriptural literature is the Pope ever associated with the personage of the Antichrist, nowhere. First and foremost, we have to distinguish Antichrist, okay? Antichrist has four different definitions. There is the scriptural definition of Antichrist that's only found once in the New Testament by John in his letter. He says that anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist. Okay? So this is not limited to an individual, it's anybody. That's the biblical Antichrist that can apply to anybody. The second interpretation meaning of Antichrist is found in the patristics, the writings of the church fathers, where here it's a male individual, a tyrant, who usurps power, is materially wealthy, ex and ex exceeding wealth, and is an inimical toward the church. In the Old Testament, the, Jew the, the Kahal Yahweh, the, the Jewish people that brought us to the Christian faith through Christ, the Messiah. And it's a, a male individual. Why do I say this? It's also found in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but he doesn't mention Antichrist. He says, man of iniquity, the man of lawlessness, the abomination of desolation, as does Daniel. But he doesn't mention Antichrist. We have to be specific here with the terms we use. So Paul, when he's speaking of this man, man of iniquity, he says that he will sit himself in the throne of God and declare himself God. Now this word, hestekota in Greek, he will sit himself, is the third person singular for the male gender. He will sit himself. So it's a male individual, this man of iniquity, even says man, right? And he will sit himself okay, in the throne of God and declare himself God. That's the patristic interpretation of Antichrist. It's a male tyrant. Paul calls it, you may call it a male, male abomination of desolation, man of lawlessness, iniquity, etc. Then there's the mystical understanding of Antichrist, which again applies to a male individual. Several people speak about this, or collectively to several individuals. In the writings of two mystics, for example, it speaks of um, two eschatological Antichrists, two male individuals. One is known as the false prophet, found in Revelation chapters 20, 1920, known as the false prophet, who works with a series of pagan nations known as the beast. This comes before this period of a thousand years of peace that John speaks about in Revelation. A thousand years is a long period of time, not necessarily, necessarily limited to exactly a thousand years, but necessarily a long period of time. Then after this period of peace, Satan is released from his confinement. And then there emerges another mysterious evil individual, male, named Gog, who works with the evil nations known as Magog. So here you have two male, eschatological antichrist figures in two male human beings. Now that's the mystical interpretation. So you have the scriptural, the patristic, the mystical, and then you have the magisterial. 
And Cardinal Ratzinger says that Antichrist wears many masks in many generations, meaning it's not applicable to just one male person. It could be King Apiphanes, Nero, Valerian, all these who persecuted Christians, Diocletian, or it could apply to other people that killed masses of people in, in the church and outside the church through history, and it could apply to the future. That's the magisterial interpretation of Antichrist. So in, see how complicated the answer is to your question. When we say that Rome will be the seat of the Antichrist, who are we speaking about, right? One person, several people. Here again, Mary at La Salette does not mention the Pope at all. She never mentions the Pope. What people who are not conversant in mystical theology fail to acknowledge is the simple distinction between the city of Rome, which goes beyond the Vatican, well beyond the Vatican, and the Catholic hierarchy, which is not limited. It goes well beyond Rome, okay? So they seem, it's a simplistic mistake that they make. They say, oh, Rome, that must mean the Vatican. It doesn't mean the Vatican. Does it include the Vatican? Yes, but it doesn't mean it's just the Vatican. So when they say that the Antichrist will sit himself in Rome, they say, oh, that has to be the Vatican. Well, show me where the Blessed Mother said that. You won't find it anywhere. Nor will you find anywhere in any prophecy approved by the church that the Pope will become the Antichrist because he's not going to be the Antichrist. Jesus gave Peter, meaning or him and all his successors, the keys to the kingdom. On this rock of the papacy, he founded his church. So God will never allow the papacy to be perverted by a Pope who is an Antichrist. It will never happen. There have been over 40 anti-popes in the church, but guess what? Not one of them was a real Pope. They were all imposters usurping the Petrine powers illegitimately because they were never elected in a valid conclave. So these anti-popes really were never popes. They were people claiming to be the Pope and never were the Pope. Never has a validly elected Pope ever been um, associated with the Antichrist, never. It may be within the hierarchy, but that's not the Pope. Okay, the Pope will never be, God will never allow that to happen. Now, again, is this Antichrist figure in the hierarchy? Is he in the laity? Is he in the world somewhere else? I put out a book entitled Antichrist in the End Times in which I show historically every Antichrist ever identified has always come from the Middle East area. And I show you that in the scriptures where it talks about Ag, King, King Ag, Agog, which God comes from in the book of Revelation. They're all connected. He's a male tyrant. He always has these three qualities. A male tyrant, inimical toward the church. He hates the church. He wants to destroy the church. And three, he is excessively wealthy. He usurps his power, excessively wealthy, hates the church, and oh, is a male tyrant. Well, that's it for this video. And again, thanks so much for taking the time to watch. If there's any feedback or any specific subject or individual that you'd like me to cover, please do let me know in the comments below. Until then, stay healthy, stay safe, and God bless you.